Hey everybody, how's it going? Something I mentioned in a recent community post that I made in a pinned comment, and also in the video I did yesterday, is that when it comes to right to repair, I am more than happy to speak to people on every side of the political spectrum. I don't care what your political party or affiliation is, nor do I care what your views are on a number of other topics. This is one of those areas that whether you play for Team Red or Team Blue, at the end of the day, it's not like, you know, abortion rights, immigration, taxation, gun rights, where there's massive disagreements. This is something where I believe that I can sell virtually anybody on the idea that you should be able to get your product fixed somewhere but the dealer, and if a company is going out of their way to be an asshole and keep you from being able to do that, that that's bad. And this is something that I, I believe is has, has wide support, so I am more than happy to speak to people on any side of the political aisle. One person was mad on my community page because I was speaking to someone from a political party that they did not like. And uh, the opposite of that is, let's say if I'll speak to someone who is more on the conservative side of things, people will say that is a complete waste of time. They want smaller government. If this is advocating for use of existing antitrust legislation or a different piece of legislation that would get across what you want, they are going to immediately oppose it. Therefore, it is a waste of time. And I don't believe it is a waste of time to speak to virtually anybody, regardless of their views on this topic. So I spoke to someone here from the American Conservative, and I was going to read the article that they wrote on this issue. They came to my shop to give me an interview, and I thought it was actually very well researched. The journalist was citing things that were said that were about two hours in to a three and a half hour video that was four or five years old. So that means they were digging through this content, finding my three to four hour videos and actually watching the entire thing so that they could cite what was said at two or three hours into the video, which I was very impressed with. So I wanted to share this. This is from the American Conservative. It says, Apple's quiet war on independent repairmen. The tech behemoth's near monopoly power allows it to maintain control over its products even after consumers buy them. This is by Napoleon Lenarthatos. I apologize if I butchered the pronunciation of your name. In the past, a Goliath's strength would be gauged in height measured in cubits, the brass of the helmet, the coat of mail with a weight in the thousands of shekels in bronze and a spear's head weighed in the hundreds of shekels of iron. Nowadays, a Goliath corporation can just hire another Goliath, such as the law firm Kilpatrick and Townsend, with its 650 lawyers and 19 offices in North America, Europe, and Asia. The firm boasts that five of the world's most valuable brands turn to Kilpatrick Townsend to grow and defend the value of their products and businesses. One of those five of the ten world's most valuable brands was interested in a video made by YouTuber Lewis Rossman. When Rossman was contacted by Kilpatrick and Townsend on behalf of Apple, he felt as if the Grim Reaper was knocking at his door. As owner of a small business, an Apple devices repair store, a few years back, Rossman had started a YouTube channel to cover all things that interested him. Apple device repairs, business advice, personal advice, and occasionally, though more so as of late, social or political commentary. The video that had gotten the attention of Apple was one in which Rossman had showed a schematic of an Apple device and proceeded to show his viewers how one could fix their own device if they faced the same issue. For Apple, the act of showing the schematic on YouTube was a violation of its intellectual copyright. They wanted Rossman to quietly make the video disappear. Rossman hired a lawyer, and the lawyer advised that the request was sensible. There was no lawsuit, and thus the reasonable thing to do was comply. Besides, a genuine effort had been made to butter up Rossman. The word came that both Kilpatrick Townsend and Apple liked his work. Rossman thought about the option that was given, then he fired his lawyer. The arrival of Kilpatrick Townsend gave Rossman another push to get more involved in the right to repair movement. Right to Repair is a nationwide effort that aims to use legislation to return to consumers the choice of where and how to fix devices they own. Rossman argues that what is going on now would be unthinkable just a few decades back. Corporations back then respected consumers' right to fix their stuff. Schematics were widely available. You could buy them at the local electronics store or contact a manufacturer to send them to you. Appliances, like refrigerators, often came with a set of schematics and instructions for how to fix them. Apple tries to inculcate into the minds of its customers an assumption that devices should only be repaired by the corporation and its controlled network of authorized repair stores. The controlled networks of authorized repair stores are used to create the illusion of consumer choice while they act in a way of reinforcing and consolidating the cons corporation's monopoly power over the repair process. Jessa Jones, owner of an independent repair service who lobbies for right to repair, testified in Boston that her group up to that point had fixed 30,000 devices, less than 5% of which would be considered fixable by authorized repairs. Rossman does not like Apple. <laughs> Many of his videos are about how the company is screwing, ripping off, torturing, and generally abusing its customers. There are videos where he explains why owning pro uh, Apple products is a daft idea or declares that the newest operating system delivers a big kick in the balls to Apple users. 
Rossman has a genuine, deep, and merciless view of Apple. Even knowing that, when I show up to Rossman's office for an interview, I place an iPhone next to him to record our conversation. Then I pull out an iPad with my questions and an Apple Pencil to jot things down. I raise my arm, pull up my sleeve, and look at an Apple Watch, saying, we are on time. I was looking for a reaction, but Rossman remains calm, cool, and collected. There is a light smirk forming in his face, and that's all I'm going to get. To explain how he makes a living off Apple products, while at the same time he strongly dislikes the company and its products, Rossman tells me oncologists don't like cancer very much. They still try to help people with it. What drives him nuts, he says, is when people pay for a device with a design flaw and are told at Apple's Genius Bar that the problem is how they use the device. Six months later, a recall program would come out, and they, the customers, would bring it up to Apple and say, can you fix this? Sorry, can't. People would get screwed over again and again and still buy it. There are also problems that never seem to be fixed. Rossman talks of a four-year-old design flaw in a 2016 Mac where 52 volts of the line for screen power is right next to the image line, that's one volt, creating serious problems for the owners. Often it takes a long time for Apple to acknowledge such issues, and sometimes it never does. A couple of days after our interview, a U.S. district judge sided with the plaintiffs saying against Apple, saying that Apple knowingly sold 2016 to 2017 MacBook Pro models with FlexGate display defect. Talking about the abuses of Apple is one of the reasons that Rossman's YouTube channel has been successful, with now more than 1.5 million subscribers. If Apple wants a video down, Rossman would like them to file a copyright claim. In doing so, Apple would have to make its reasons public. They would have to say, we object to Lewis showing where the fuse is, he said. I want you to publicly state on the record that you don't want your customers to know where the keyboard fuse is. A study from 2011 found that consumers who used independent auto repair shops spent about 24% less on repairs each year. The very important price differential was achieved while the small repair shops faced substantial artificial barriers in doing business. In the tech realm, Apple used its enormous financial heft as a purchaser of parts in order to force its suppliers into contracts that prohibit them from selling parts to independent repair stores. Rossman has to get on Skype with people around the globe that specialize in part dumpster dives in order to find parts that suppliers are not permitted to sell him. At other times, he has to buy a whole device only to retrieve a single chip out of it. One can only imagine the savings for consumers if an open market were allowed to operate when it comes to parts, schematics, and diagrams. A 2018 study shown by CBC, the Canadian Public Broadcast Service, highlighted Apple's predatory practices. A MacBook is taken to an Apple store for repair as CBC wanted to test the pervasive perception that Apple's customers are wildly overcharged. The Apple Store employee informs the undercover journalist that fixing the computer will cost 1200 Canadian dollars. And just in my note here, they actually set up to 1900 if they had to replace a second piece of it. But let's continue. They might as well get a new computer. Then CBC takes the same computer with the same problem to Rossman in New York. It takes a couple of seconds for Rossman to figure out the problem and about a minute and a half to fix it. There is a pin that is sticking out. The pin is put back into place and the connector is plugged in. Problem solved and zero charge. The show goes on to show the many ways that Apple impedes repairs. Special made non-standard screws so the devices cannot be easily opened, gluing batteries that do not need to be glued in, and so on. Then there is the issue of planned obsolescence, where older iPhones become significantly slower after a system update. All to make independent repairs much more difficult. All to make the purchase of a new device the more practical option. The size of a corporation like Apple allows it to shield itself from the consequences of the policies it advocates. Backing leftist policies at home while stashing cash, the cash abroad allows for virtue signaling at the best possible side of the profit margin. He gets it. Apple's tiny competitors in the device repair space don't have those options. They cannot do their work in a cheap sweatshop abroad. They cannot direct their profits to a bank account in Ireland. And see, here's why it's worth talking to people on the other side of the political aisle. Because they can see through BS too. It doesn't matter if you're talking to someone on the left, libertarian, right. At the end of the day, they get it. If they want to get it, they'll get it. Apple's predatory practices of today became the industry standard of tomorrow, at least up to 2019. Apple captured 66% of all profits of the mobile phone industry globally. The corporation that makes the most profit as it sells you a new device goes out of its way to restrict and squeeze every possible penny out of the repair process. How can any other corporation competing in the same space, making much less money than Apple with the sale of new devices, justify to its board and shareholders selling devices that can be repaired easily and cheaply? The mobile phone business is a tough one, with Samsung getting just 17% of profits and everybody else straggling with what's left. On April 5th, LG announced it was exiting the incredibly competitive mobile phone sector. 
Apple uses acquisitions to eliminate competition, acquiring future competitors or acquiring technology that could have been available to its present competitors. Global Data, an information services company, found that Apple bought more AI companies than anyone else between 2016 and 2020. When it comes to independent repair stores, Apple employs a different strategy. It tries to cancel them as an idea, as a way of doing business, as a legitimate consumer choice. Planned obsolescence is coming to the independent repair store. It is interesting how Apple responded to the aforementioned news report by CBC. What it chose to say in its own defense was that the customers are best served by Apple certified experts using genuine parts. Apparently, the contractual restrictions Apple has imposed on its suppliers are what makes it better at this. In the past few years, right to repair supporters have gathered in state legislatures across America, trying to establish a competitive marketplace for repairs. Some of Rossman's videos take us to these initiatives. The right to repair crew doesn't seem to fit in in the halls of power, in their jeans, t-shirts, hoodies, a congregation of misfits. How unaccustomed we have become to the visual of ordinary people trying to persuade their representatives. There are legislators in the building, corporate lobbyists, and then these people. These people are the only ones losing money by being there. You remembered what I said. As Rossman goes around with his microphone, we meet the guy with the repair store in the middle of nowhere. We meet Jessa Jones, the stay-at-home mom with a PhD in molecular genetics, who started fixing devices after her toddler twins had flushed her brand new iPhone down the toilet. We meet the guy who was stocking shelves at Walmart in the early hours of the morning and just made it in. On the other side, the corporate lobbying side, all is proper and posh. The right shoes, the right ties, shirts and suits, the proud cogs of the machine. At the legislatures, they feel right at home and it shows. They know they can kill the right to repair bill in committee. Nothing much to worry about. Their statements are generic, formulaic, vehemently not specific, and boring to the point of suicide. Rossman is trying now to go directly to the people with a GoFundMe that has raised hundreds of thousands in a matter of days. Nevertheless, the future of the right to repair movement and the independent repair shop seems uncertain. What is not uncertain is what it's all about. The right to repair is nothing more than the effort to reinstate the individual's rights of ownership. It is a movement so contrary to the new subscription model of life, where you are always one payment away from losing it all. An environment of centralized control, where everything is always supervised, curated, and monitored by a managerial class increasingly skeptical of the individual will. We are being conditioned to a state of digital serfdom, as if it has been algorithmically dictated that individual choice and individuality are no more. The right to repair is the glitch to the propertyless future before us. I think this is an amazingly well done article. I think he hit the nail on the head that he, he got all the individual points that when we show up to legislatures, you have normal people that are speaking versus lobbyists that are making often horrible arguments. And, you know, his words, not mine, to the point of suicide from boredom, th that this is about the right to personal property in a future where people are slowly trying to take away that ability to maintain your own property, where everything is going to that point of the recurring revenue bundle, or as Scott Galloway calls it, the rundle, which is a way for the company to make more money at the expense of your property rights. And I strongly believe that when you make this case, 90% of the people out there are going to say, I agree. And the 10% that don't are either very ideologically rigid about a particular principle, or B, they just don't understand it. But it's most certainly always worth it to talk to as many people as humanly possible. I got a list of people that you suggested I speak to, whether on podcast or video or anything like that, to collaborate with. And I'm in the process of reaching out to all of those people. Some I already have, some I will be reaching out to again. And I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss with this issue with virtually anybody. My favorite parts of this article, at the you know, since this is called the American Conservative, uh, my personal favorite was where they say the size of a corporation like Apple allows it to shield itself from the consequences of the policies it advocates. Backing leftist policies at home while stashing the cash abroad allows for virtue signaling at the best possible side of the profit margin. Apple's tiny competitors on the device repair space don't have these options. They cannot do their work in a cheap sweatshop abroad. They cannot direct their profits to a bank account in Ireland. So when someone says, it's worthless to discuss right to repair with someone who is to the right of the political aisle, I disagree. Because when you make the argument they'll get where we're coming from and they'll see right through what's going on. So that's it for today. Uh, as always, I hope you learned something. And I wish there were more journalists like this person here. Because when I met him and I first started talking to him, it seemed like he had some clear skepticism on this. But as he dug, he, he really did dig into every single part of this. And again, he was quoting lines from videos from 2015, 16, and 17 that were two hours in to a three to four hour video. 
That is an insane amount of research that you just don't see done nowadays for an article. Many articles are just ideologically driven. I have this idea. I'm not going to bother looking into it anymore. I'm not going to bother looking into facts. I'm not going to bother asking questions. And this dude dug in as much as humanly possible. There had to have been an absolute minimum of 15 hours of research done here, just so that he could have watched the content necessary to be able to ask me the questions that he asked me. And that is not something that I see from a lot of modern journalism. So my hat's off to Napoleon at the American Conservative. Thank you very much for having me there for an interview. And thank you very much for doing this piece and giving right to repair a fair shake. Uh, I'll see you all in the next video. Really? Really, you're not going to leave until I do it, are you? Fine.